<laughs> Before we get into it, though, uh, let's just update. I want to update on what you guys are working on. Um, so, Will, what are you working on? I, I feel like it's going to be the same a lot. I'm, I've still got the uh, the Bonaparte sequel. And I'm, yeah, how's that coming? I'm, I'm, I've sent in my sketches and waiting to hear back. Uh-huh. And uh, I liked it. It's, it's got a lot of fun action in it. Um, so we'll see. And then I'm also working on uh, a a board game. It's not a boring game. It's a board game. <laughs> Why did you take the board game project? Why did I take that? It's a game. Because you've always wanted to work on a game. Well, I've I've worked on several games before, but this one, I it, it's all about teaching kids different emotions, uh-huh. and I love. Is it done in your is it done in your pencil no, style? No, it's in my paint my digital painting style. So um it's pretty straightforward, but it's it's every emotion you can possibly imagine and I think the kids are going to have to try to you know like look at the cards and then guess the emotion and it's just a fun challenge to to try to capture, you know, like what is the essence of this particular emotion. Yeah. I'm trying to get it in one illustration and just you know, So for you character. for you taking on this project was a it it was something a little bit different. It was a little more challenging. And B, uh, I assume the money's okay. Yeah, money's this money's definitely not great on this one. But the art, you know, I worked with the art director and said, "Will I get creative freedom? That's the only way I can do it for the the budget that you're working on." And he said, "Yeah, he's not going to hassle me." So it's really up to I'm basically playing art director as well. Oh, okay, well, that's yeah. good. Sometimes that's. You know, sometimes having the creative freedom is like the worst thing. <laughs> yeah. But but I feel like watching sure. you work on this, I feel like you're you're having fun with it. Yeah. Cool. Lee, I haven't seen any of that work. I want I want you to send me some. I'll send it. you some. I need to see it <laughs> so I can comment, give you my feedback. What are you working on, Lee? I have just moved across this great country of ours. <laughs> I stopped in Utah and Colorado and uh, Kansas as quick as I could get through Kansas. <laughs> I did. No offense to anyone living in Kansas. You um, started. You started in Pro, uh, <laughs> Portland, right? Portland, Oregon. Yep. And so now I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. So I'm just getting set up my studio. I set up my monitor today, and I'm I'm working on. Uh, uh, two books, one that I am writing and illustrating myself, and then another one we're working on the details of the deal uh, for one that someone else wrote that I may illustrate. And so kind of just getting set up for the next uh, next phase. Mm, cool. So now you grew up in Tennessee though, right? Yep, native Nashvillian. So you, and you lost your accent about when? It's coming back. <laughs> You've heard that you can, you can never Here's go home, it. right? What does that mean? You've never heard that? It's like a literary oh. thing. You you can never go home, meaning you can never, uh, you'll never, going home will never feel the same. You, uh, it's like. As we say in the South, Kate never could do nothing. <laughs> it's like in the hero's journey, uh, like Frodo, when he went back, right? It right. was different. He, different. He's like, what did he say? He's like, what was his line, Jake? You know these lines. I can't remember. I just keep thinking about that giant pumpkin that the. The guy brings in, he's showing off this massive pumpkin. Yeah. And everybody, all anybody cares about is the pumpkin. Right. When these four guys just saved their lives, you know. Right. <laughs> and that's the thing is that you're changed. The idea of the hero's journey is you're changed forever. So, you, so you'll never yeah. experience home like it was before. Well, I will, I will say this, that if it was like it was before, I will, I, there was a reason. Yeah, maybe that you're I not left. a hero if, if it it's the way. same, right? <laughs> I don't want it to be the same because it sucked when I was here before. And now Nashville has come a long, long, long way in the past uh, 20 years. Very progressive compared to what it was when I was here growing up. And so, which is good. I mean, there's better food and there's better bike lanes and, you know, all the stuff that the, that I've grown accustomed to on the West coast is now spread, I think across the whole United States, not just, I think most of the big cities are starting to catch on for that kind of lifestyle. Did you, uh, are you going by the same name? That you went by when you lived here, I'm, there. <laughs> I'm going by Luke Skywalker now. <laughs> um, that's good. I'm actually. I, I want to. I think Will and I need to come out and visit visit you. Yeah. When uh, oh, we may do a workshop. I don't want to throw this out there too formally, but we may do a workshop in Nashville that's live 
with all three That'd of us. Cool. I get the guest house. You do get the guest <laughs> house. Jake gets the uh, hotel. <laughs> Wait, why? <laughs> oh, because... I'm just kidding. You, you can have the guest house, too. I have a guest house now, and uh, you guys can all be in well, there with your whole I'm, families. It'll be Because I don't want to be there with... Do you Will, sound like so. a jerk saying that? Do you feel like a jerk at all saying that? The guest house? Yeah. Oh, about the guest house? <laughs> no, only if I started commenting on how much you can drive the golf cart. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, <not>. man. <laughs> okay, Jake, what are you working on? What? Are, right. So this month has been so busy. Uh, I've done, I've either been out of town or had a big project every single weekend. Like I told Allison, I said, do you realize in June, I won't, you, like you do not get a Saturday with me at all. And, uh, and so that's what, let's see, what did I do? I did a comic con in Denver I did a conference up in Boise. Um, I did a workshop here at our studio, a day-long power day is what I called it. And I forget what was the other... Oh, we were supposed to record that class one of the Saturdays, but that fell through. So I ended up working on the children's book that I'm working on, which is Snow, uh, Snowplow 2. Still working on that. And um, Skyheart is at the printers in China... This this uh, printer that I'm working with doesn't have like an office in the U.S., so the the there's a little bit of translation I think issues happening, and it's been a little hard to communicate, which has slowed the project down mm-hmm. a bit. But the price is just right, so <laughs> I'm willing to deal with it. We'll see when the books get here if they printed them in black and white or color. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what are we talking about this week? All right, yeah. So this week uh, is Will's I th- topic. I thought this was your idea, Lee. No. The- <laughs> Don't look this way. So this- let me just introduce this because my my two companions here don't have a whole lot of faith in this topic, but I think it's going to be fun. So the idea is basically how do children's book awards and comic book awards fit into the professional illustrator's um, maybe into their marketing plan, into um, how they develop their their art, and, their and basically just kind of talk about um, you know are they a factor, aren't they a factor? Basically everything you might want to know about these kinds of awards, and just kind of kind of dive in and and see what we come up with. So yes, it is a gamble, but I I I love this subject. So you guys. This podcast can only be good with your support, okay, you guys? <laughs> we'll do our best. Before we go any further, I before we go any further, are you... I I like awards. I'm going like to throw awards. that out there. I'm crazy I'm that way. On that. <laughs> <laughs> it's controversial. Before we go, go any further, Will, though, are you seriously going to wear the sunglasses the whole time? I am. <laughs> I have I thought to. it was just I'm a trying joke. To th- I'm trying to throw you <laughs> off your games, you guys. <laughs> All right. I think the podcast is going to Will's head with these sunglasses. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're going to dive in. So if you are listening to this and you, you know, maybe you're you're new to illustration and maybe you're you maybe you've been here for a long time, been an illustrator for a long time, and you probably know a lot about the awards we're going to talk about, you'll probably learn something new. Or this might actually open up an avenue. It might actually open up um, some thinking that you hadn't really factored into how you're developing your art. So the first question I would ask, well, do you guys think we should talk about the awards first and then talk about the, you know, like how? They- yeah, let's throw out some examples of what we're, what kind of awards okay. we're talking yeah, about. Let's do maybe. that. What are the major awards, Will? So the the two that I really want to talk about are the Caldecott Award and maybe the Eisner, maybe the Newberry. I guess that's three. Um, and just let people understand. And I think we, we mentioned this actually in a, in a previous podcast. Uh, we, we glanced on awards just briefly um, that they can be life-changing um, and that uh, for the people that win the, the bigger ones, their career is never the same. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to, to kind of talk about this. So tell us what what is the Caldecott, what's the Newberry, and what's the Eisner? Okay, so 
We'll start with Caldecott. Caldecott is uh, an award that was actually uh, conceived in 1937 uh, by Randall Caldecott. And without going into the boring history on all of this, it's it's the awards that the the Caldecott and the Newberry. Newberry is given to young adult fiction. Caldecott is given to the mo- the most distinguished picture book, and the Eisner is given to the in the comic book industry for the. I don't, I don't know what I don't know much about the Eisner. I was hoping to get that from you, Jake. Yeah. Is so it, that is it to the best? What like what is the charge of that award? The so there's it's it's sort of like the Academy Awards, but for comic books instead of for films. So there's a bunch of different categories you can win an Eisner in. So it would be like the best, um, you know, overall publication. It could be like best writer, best artist, best letterer, best short story, mm. best single series, or you know, best um, publication for kids. So there's so, a lot of different Eisners given out. Yeah, so there's probably 20 different, maybe even 30 different Eisner Awards. Um, that is it. Is it just a, I mean, maybe we're going to go into this later, so I don't want to jump the gun, but is it just a, 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 a trophy kind of thing, like the Oscars, or do you, is there anything that comes with it, like a publishing gig or something no, like that? No, usually what happens, yeah, it's, it's an award that you get, a trophy, and then a sticker goes on your book, it says it won an Eisner, and, um, and then... That's the extent of, I guess, what the Eisners actually award out. The publishers, though, love it because their book wins an award and they get to put the sticker on it and they get to push it as, um, you know, as a, as an Eisner award winning book. And also, uh, you know, the, the, the creator who won the award now has a bargaining chip for their next project. Mm. Yeah, so... These different awards, I mean, we're, we're probably not talking about Newberry, although that's also given out by the American Library Association. Think about the, the most, one of the most interesting things for me about thinking about this award and the, the librarians and all that give it out. When I was in school, I, you know, I, I, number one, I hated school growing up. And the last thing in the world I ever thought I would go to is a librarian convention. <laughs> in fact, in fact, me and two of the guys that I went with, illustrators, uh, one was Guy Francis and Nate Hale, we started playing a game of can you spot the librarian? So whenever we were out, you know, not in the at the convention, but in a restaurant or in an elevator, we would just say, um, excuse me, are you here for the conference? You know, like we would first like yes or no, you know. What was your success rate? <laughs> it was pretty low. Uh, librarians come in all different shapes, sizes, colors, you know, and nice. So we're dispelling the, uh, the kind of nerdy. They definitely side none of, of them had the, the, um, the little chains on their glasses, you know? Um, but that, that's a, the last thing I ever thought I would go to is a, an ALA conference. And I've been to three of them now and it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's where illustration, children's book illustration and, and librarians collide, I guess. I mean, there's this, you know, there's this definite connection. And I just never saw myself ever giving it, caring anything about what a librarian thinks. And now, of course, as, as a children's book illustrator, you have to care what librarians think because they're the ones that recommend your book or not, you know. And so some some illustrators really pander to librarians. But anyway, um, the Caldecott is the most, is, is it's by far the biggest award that's given out for children's books. I'm the, so we've talked about the Eisners for, for comic books. And there are probably a lot of people listening that are doing different types of illustration. And there are probably other big awards that we're not going to really talk about too much in this. But I, I would I, I would imagine that what we're going to say about these awards would probably uh, cross over into other markets as well. Now, the Caldecott, let, let, I'll just kind of go through some of this stuff just to kind of give a, a, a little history Wait, you haven't told us what the Newberry Award is. Uh, the new, uh, I yeah, I did. I touched on it just a little bit. It's for it's for um, young adult fiction. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So if uh, it goes to writers, it goes to writers. Yeah, it's a writing award. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. The interesting, an interesting thing about the Caldecott Award is that it's 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 um, given out from a committee of fifteen people, and most of those eight of those are appointed positions 
from the ALA, which is the American Library Association, and their librarians. The other seven are appointed or not or voted on, and they are usually also librarians, but they could also be school teachers. Um, and so it's it's interesting that this art award is being given out by non not non trained artists uh, or not artists, right? They're librarians. Primarily. I would say is is it the only art award that is, isn't judged by artists? Probably yeah, isn't judged by artists. Yeah. Because they're judging it, the book as a whole, not just as an art art piece, right? But as a story, they're not supposed know, to. As an experience, right? They're not supposed to judge the story. And that was another thing that I wanted to talk about. Is that what's interesting is so so it's only supposed to be given out for the art. They're only supposed to consider mm. the art. However, to, to my knowledge and from what I've seen, there's never been a, a Caldecott book selected with a really poorly written story mm-hmm. and and as librarians i i don't think that you could allow yourself to give that award to great art and a bad story and personally i wish that the charge was for both so on the um on the wikipedia page it says that the medal is for distinguished illustrator illustrations in a picture book and for excellence of pictorial presentation for children and then it says components other than illustration should be considered as they bear on effectiveness as a children's picture book so other components like but definitely not story the story (laughs) (laughs) so so it is it is a story and it should be and it should be now i've always heard it it's that their charge is this is you're just supposed to be you know like when we had we had Gene Nelson on our third Thursday uh-huh. um, thing and he said that too he said that's the charge that you're given as a uh, he's been a committee member twice um, so he's judged the, the for the Caldecotts twice now mm-hmm. okay and you know and and a lot of my information comes from him actually and from um, Carla Morris who's also a, a friend of mine and another person who served on the Caldecott committee one year. Um, they're supposed to award, like you said, they're supposed to, they're supposed to give this award to the most distinguished picture book. What does that mean? What does distinguished mean? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I'll leave that to the judges. Well, the definition <laughs> that I got off of Google is successful, authoritarian, authoritative and commanding great respect. Okay. So it mean it's basically still doesn't tell you anything. Like <laughs> it's pretty pretty vague, but is there, you know, talking about the writing and the and the illustrating mixed or or being separated, is there the first thing I start to think about when entering contests, is there a way to game the system? And so I look for consistencies. I don't know why I think that way. I actually looked up how to win uh-huh. at Monopoly the other day. So there is I didn't think there was any true technique to Monopoly, but there is. <laughs> Anyway, it's a side <laughs> note. So if you play me in some kind of game and I get a chance to research, I'm probably going to have some kind of statistical advantage. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I can vouch for that because when, when I, you took me to play frisbee golf, uh huh, I, I could see your That's gamesmanship true, coming out. I can't help it. I'm, I'm a twin, and so it, it's, it's <laughs> don't ever play frisbee um, golf. So, with me, so, by the way. <laughs> so when when I look at say 2000. Uh, the year 2000, all the way to present, how many of them, without looking, would you guys say are written and illustrated by different people? I think Versus I looked this up once what, a while back, and I th- I think the more recent books are almost all single people, all like, like writer illustrator person. combo. Uh, uh, writer illustrator. I would combo. say it's yeah, like seventy five percent writer illustrator combos. I think it's a little higher. I don't have a percentage, uh-huh. but it's like since 2000, like four of them have been written by someone oh, else. Oh, wow. So since 2000, you're so saying about the last- close to so, 75%. So you're saying like 14 of the books is were done by one person. They the wrote it and they illustrated Correct. it. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a little bit more than a random statistic at that point, yeah. wouldn't yeah. you yeah. say? So if you want to- so step one to winning a Caldecott is don't work with a writer. <laughs> 
These are actionable <laughs> items that we. Well, what's interesting? <laughs> me and me. And, an interesting <laughs> thing about that is, and I've heard editors talk about this, is they really like to promote a person, and it, and it's harder for them to physically send two people around. You know, they, they, yeah. They, so, and and I think that translates down to the committees too. I think they really like to celebrate this one person they they really do treat when you if you win this award you are you are the miss america of the children's book world for a year you know you hold the title and you are treated as such and is there so, uh a, a, like a swimsuit aspect to winning the award too <laughs> they took that away <laughs> oh okay. they used to <laughs> <laughs> oh if so, Lee's totally a shoe in this year. <laughs> <laughs> I just got my speedo. What do you mean? There's no. <laughs> oh man. So yeah. So, um, you know, this kind of jumps the gun. One of my questions was: Is it can can winning these awards change your life? And I think for for many illustrators, especially winning the Caldecott. Now, there are over 200 children's book awards, and most of them, I would say almost all of them would not change, be life-changing. And we, we talked about this in the other podcast. I've won like five different awards from different states. So almost every state has at least one award. And you will get a little seal printed on your book. I got, um, I got, I won the North Carolina Book Award one year. And it wasn't anything that I even knew I was up for. My publisher um, entered all these different uh, award competitions with, with books, which means they had to physically send out Mm-hmm. those books uh to be considered yeah it's a it's a full-time job for a publisher to to submit for all these awards it's a lot of work and that's and like and there and there's varied as so each state has their their award and i one of my books won an award in in minnesota and but there's even as specific as like there's an award here in utah for like if you're a mormon art illustrator there's an award that they give to like best mormon illustrator you know, so that it could be like as narrow and as specific as that. That one's life to, changing. I'm sure, yes, it is. Huh? <laughs> so yeah, so so yeah, tons of different awards, and uh, but when you if you were to win the Caldecott, and I, I don't know about the Eisners, I know the Newberries like this as well. That will stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, you will you will always be introduced as Caldecott winning award winning illustrator so and so. Mm -hmm. Um, your books will stay that book and most of your other books will stay in print for the rest of your life. And that translates to a ton of money. Um, Mm -hmm. for instance, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. If you're going to give it, I've got a specific example, but it sounds like, well, yeah, I was going to say say that there are over 200 libraries, um, I believe in the U S 200,000 libraries in the U S but between colleges um, and all the school libraries, all the school libraries from from elementary schools through high schools, um, private and public libraries. There's somewhere. Uh, what I heard at the at the Zayla conference is that there's somewhere around 200, and th- that could be worldwide. I could have that wrong. It could be worldwide, but there are there are you know just you there's know, uh, more libraries than Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's and true. And every one of these libraries. <laughs> they open another library right on the corner from this last library. <laughs> <laughs> but they all they all will stock the Caldecott Award winners. Yeah, you got What to kind of them. library doesn't? It's, it's, it's kind of a, yeah, it's a safe bet for them. And it will be forever. I mean, if you guys think about how movies work, you know, the Academy Award winners are the ones 50 years right. from now. That's the ones that still have, there's a list still like, oh, go, you know, Academy Award winners and it stays on the list, whereas everything else drops away in history, right. you know? And so I think it's a safe bet for librarians and it's also a safe bet for bookstores to just say, hey, here's the one that's won award. I don't really, they don't even have to vouch for it really because there's already this built in yeah. approval system from the stamp on the front of you the book. It would be a cool list to make, uh, to pull librarians um, across the country and ask them, you know, let's do a top 100 books in the last century that were not Caldecott winners. And, uh, yeah. and that'd be interesting to see. Yeah. They wouldn't even know a book before 1995. Uh, That's Probably true. Not. Okay. How about this century? <laughs> the, the, the 21st century. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm, librarians are going to write in and they're going to kill me. <laughs> I know that librarians know <laughs> books before 1995. <laughs> um, one of my uh, uh, the, the artists that was signed with my agent, my previous agent, had won. Not he didn't win the call to cut, but he got a runner uh-huh. up. An honor book. And it it was a uh, was say it that a, again? A, Will a cut honor. out a little bit. Oh yeah, exactly. Caldecott honor. And so I was asking just some kind of rough numbers of what that means. Um, and this is still you know just a couple years out from winning it, but significant enough where it's not still a new mm-hmm. book in print, like four or five years old. Uh, and they're getting about seventy five grand per year in royalties from that book. Still. Wow! But so that's an honor book, right? That's, that's not, an honor book. Yeah, it it didn't even win. So that so that win. brings up this. So with the, with the committee, they basically they choose the Caldecott, and then they choose up to. There, there actually isn't a number, believe it or not. They, they can assign as many honor books as they want. The committee that assigned the most one year was five, and the fewest is two. And a lot of years they've done two. There's a lot of years that have done three, four, and, and I think only one or two years they've hmm. done five. Yeah, since I've been paying attention, it's been like four. Yeah, and and the committee members will say they don't want to dilute the award, so they they like to they would never want to go more than you know five, I guess. But anyway, yeah, I have another actionable item by the way on winning a call to cut. So the first one is you know write your own books. Mm-hmm. Number two is be John Classic. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> looking at the recent years, if you're John Class and you will win one, if something you went to out. school, John, right? No, no, I, he he came up uh, to Portland to work on um, on Cor- Coraline for oh, like. Oh, that's right. That's how you knew him. So that so that's how I know him. Uh, Chris Applehans was also one. He I went okay. to school with him. But John John is the coolest guy ever. So if there's anybody who should win a bunch, <laughs> it's him because um, it never goes to his head. He's the most humble person in the world. Nice. But he won a lot of them. Yeah, his um, I Want My Hat Back. That one, an honor, I believe, right? No, that got the, that got the full that the deal. Full and then the, the next, next year, he got the two. The like, one. Well, I think he got, he got the, for This Is Not My Hat, he got the actual one. That was in 2013. But then he also got the yeah. runner-up book yeah. that mm-hmm. year, too. Yeah. Crazy. And Can you imagine that call? Is they call you and they tell you that two of your books won? It's No, I can't. I can't imagine. So doing a little bit of numbers, a little bit of math, if there are 200,000 libraries, and from what I understand, the popular books that get checked out are getting replaced every year. So a lot of times they'll, they'll have between anywhere from three to 10 of one of a popular book that's getting checked out a lot at a, at a big public library. So, for instance, you know, our, our librarian here says sometimes they'll buy 10 of one Caldecott book if it's a really popular one. And they'll replace wow. that every year. So that one library is buying 10 a year for, for a while anyway. So the, the numbers, you know, if you, if you figure you win the Caldecott, there's 200,000 libraries. They're each going to order at least one and some are going to order 10 or, mm-hmm. and, and other numbers in between. And then they're going to buy them every year. If you're getting a dollar, dollar fifty a book, you can do the math on that. It's it gets pretty insane pretty quickly, and that doesn't count for all the teachers that buy, that collect Caldecott books, all the parents that collect Caldecott books that buy them. So it's like it's life changing. Yeah, exponential. I've also heard that uh, most publishers will give you a contract for your next two or three books when you win the Caldecott, like because they have to lock you in. Because if they do, if they don't, someone else will, and they can sell you as the Caldecott from a Caldecott winning illustrator, so and so, yeah, for your next I, books. Do you guys have the Caldecott clause in your con- book contracts? Have you ever seen those? I, I do have them in yeah. some of them. I can't remember. But what it's it is basically that what, what's it? Well, in it's yours? basically like if the this book wins an honor, you get an extra. Ten thousand or fifteen thousand. If it wins the actual Caldecott Award, we'll we'll pay you an extra thirty thousand. So, you know, and it's all I think percentage of what the advance was or something like that. So, uh, you know, you get a bonus too. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's my critique of this, though, and maybe this again is premature. So let me know, Will. But what what do we do? I mean, like we're talking about it like it's an attainable thing, but I almost view it as a lottery win. 
can you do something for it or should you do something for it? Or is that where we're going next? Yeah, I, f- I felt like we would end up going there eventually. Um, and now is probably just as good a time. Yeah, so read through your, your questions about exploring this topic, Will. <laughs> In order. Yeah, no, I'm just, yeah, just, yeah, just take should it you go, Should you go after it? So my, my, let me ask you guys this. Do you think that it's ever a good idea to change your art for other people? Because in order to go for this yes. award, you'd have to basically do that, right? If, if you're comfortable. Not really. Well, how, how, do you, how do you gear it for that, though? If you look at the last 10 that won Caldecott's, they're so different. Like one of them's Scratchboard and one of them's John Klassen's kind of flat style. One of them's, you know, Jerry Pinkney's watercolor or whatever. You know, it's, it's okay, all over well, the place. The so question, which one do you then pick? The, uh, uh, another question would be, um, is, is every book or every story, could every story possibly be a Caldecott winner? No. So no. that's so, that's where I'm going. That's why I'm saying should you yeah. change what you're doing to be fit in the subset of Caldecott award winners. Right. So there's there's two kinds of books that the children's book world publishes. And there's the award winning books or books that they put out there that's clearly like this is a book for uh you know the award and then there's books that are put out there that are like, this is just to sell a ton of books. So on one hand, you would have something like, I want my hat back, mm-hmm. which, you know, is artsy, right? And then on the other hand, you have Fancy Nancy. Is Fancy Nancy ever going to win a Caldecott? No. No. And why not? And yeah, that's the question. Why not? It's not distinguished. It's, it's uh, or is it distinguished? I don't know. <laughs> I, one of them is definitely playing towards a particular market. You're about to disparage Fancy Nancy, aren't you? I'm not disparage. It's a fine <laughs> set of books. We could. I, I don't know what Fancy Nancy look is. Look that up. And I'm looking yeah. it up right now. Very Nancy. extremely successful. Extremely uh, from successful a, from a, from a uh, commercial standpoint. But it's yeah, it's a, it's a commercial yeah. book, and and it's not designed to to win an award. It's not designed to. Um, you know, it's not very literary. Why it's, can't the books that I like win an award? I, I don't know. You should make the Will so Terry like, Award like the for equivalent. stupid books. <laughs> 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 Sorry. So this is the equivalent of like a, in the music industry, like a boy band. Like they're not they're not trying to be a great yeah you know right. jazz musician right. or something. They're trying to. It's just like a lowest common denominator kind of book that's going to sell a million of them but there's not much substance there exactly and then you have the books that that i think bridge the gap a little bit so um uh what's her name the the pig that dresses up as a ballerina olivia olivia yeah olivia so why am i gonna think of that i have it right here on my bookshelf ian falconer if you want to guys want to look it up ian falconer yeah so olivia is an award-winning i think caldecott winning book right or an Uh honor at least and then it's gone on to be extremely commercial, uh, and there's mm-hmm. all these different it's a Olivia franchise now spinoffs and Olivia board books, and then the Olivia, Olivia cartoon it's crazy. stuffed animals. Um, and so that was like a, a a backdoor way into being commercial, like going through. And the backstory on Ian Falconer, I don't know if you knew this, but he did not set out to be a children's book illustrator. So no. So his his thing was he was trying to become a famous gallery artist and he just happened to go to the right party in New York where there was a, a children's book editor from a big publisher there. And he made a big splash. Apparently he's, he's, uh, you know, the party guy, the kind of the loud guy at the party and somehow he got her attention and, um, showed her some sketches and she saw that little pig and she says, what's this? Oh, it's just something I've been kind of doodling. Well, have you ever thought of doing children's books, being an illustrator? No. So he wasn't even trying <laughs> to be an illustrator. And hey, those are the story. Those are the stories that annoy everybody. A, Don't yeah, say she, that story. She says, "Well, there's a story about this pig. You need to write this story about this pig." And so she helped him write the story, and the rest is history. But if you look up Olivia on Google and hit images. 
the merchandising is amazing. <laughs> the, the number of books. So I honestly feel like the to win a Caldecott is half of it is you have to be really good at your craft, right? You have to make a pretty darn good book. I think the other half is you have to be re- like known by people. Like I don't think if you look at that list of Caldecott, Caldecott winners, uh, how many of them are their first book? Most a lot, of them, a lot. Most of them are are people that have been around for a little while. The librarians are familiar with them. They like what they're doing. Like look at Peter Brown, right? Look at Dan Santat. Look at um, uh, who else? Like uh, like uh, Brian F- Jerry, yeah, Pinkney. Jerry Pinkney, Brian Floca. Is that how you say his name? Yeah, but a lot of them, a lot of them. I thought you were going in a different direction with this. A lot of them are kind of no name people that. Kind of came out of nowhere. Who? Wasn't, Find one for no, me. No, I could be now, wrong. Can, but what, what about Beth, Beth Cromis? She which did one the is scratch that? board what one. Uh, maybe like seven or eight years ago. The, the house. In, I don't know her history. Yeah, I remember it. That was a nice book. I don't know her, her history though. Um, what well, about Brian? The rest Selig of them, though, I agree with Jake. With Hugo Cabray. That's, he wasn't a big so, by any no, well, even, even if if uh, this is their first children's book, I feel like they're known in circles, in the circles that are choosing. You're probably uh, right. You know? So I, I think there's like maybe like a, a networking or a political aspect to it too. Like maybe maybe they're not well known, but the editor that they're working with is well known, you know, and mm-hmm. they trust that editor or the publisher is well known and they trust that publisher or the agent that they've that they're working with like the agent may be well known and signed up this you know hot new creator and so there's there's like some things that precede that like I don't think you're going to self publish a book and have that win a Caldecott or I don't think you're going to do a book from a small publisher and have it win I think definitely not I would definitely agree with that it's coming from yeah. Well, I mean, if you if you look at like like Dan Santet before he won for the Adventures of Beagle, which is an awesome I awesome book, book, and Dan's a really cool guy. He was he's like a keynote speaker at all the the bigger SCBWI stuff. Everybody knows him, and then he didn't win uh, like one or two years before. Maybe it was the year that that John Classen won, two thousand thirteen, where he was kind of passed over in a su- sort of surprise way. And this is the grumbling. I have no idea if any of this is you know true. Um, without talking to the uh, judges, but there was kind of a sense that he should have gotten something and kind of didn't, and then so was maybe owed a little bit. I mean, I don't want to phrase it like that because it sounds like they just would have given it to him no matter what. He made a beautiful mm-hmm. book, which did deserve mm-hmm. it, I think. Um, I but his, point is that – Well, I thought his, his last but, book deserved it too, and I, I thought that one was even better. Heck Humpty yeah. Dumpty one. Yeah, that was amazing. After that, the fall, I thought I thought that was a shoe in. I thought that was a shoe in to at least get an honor. Yeah. Did it not? I can't remember. Well, I don't think it did. Can, what is it, Wikipedia? I, I didn't say. look at the but full it was, list. This it was year. an amazing book. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great book. Yeah, and he he's just kind of. I think he's found his stride with storytelling. Um, but but to go back to Jake's point, I, th- I think everybody uh, knew him, and he was making the rounds. He wasn't just kind of a wallflower that just won this thing out of the blue. You know that's uh, step three. Are we on step three? We're on I step think three. step three so what is are our steps okay. Again? So step one is is uh, uh, be don't don't hook up with a writer. Step, <laughs> right, write your own step thing. Two, hey, you can't say it like that. Don't say it like that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Don't partner with a writer. There you go. Okay. There step go. two. What was our step two? The swimsuit thing. B oh. no. B B John. B John Classen. Step three is speak at SCBWI conferences. Like How just, do you do that? And you call everyone and just known. say, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my fee. Hey. <laughs> I love like finding a person who's won it and just back like backtracking. Like, okay, what's every step that led? Figuring you out. Know, right. Every one of these people has a different path. I mean, it is like... It, well, you- it's interesting. I know. I know one of the reasons why you were hesitant to want to talk about this, Lee, is because it's like it's like lightning striking, right? I mean, let's be honest. If you really can't, you can't 
set your career you know, on a path where eventually it leads to you winning the Caldecott. Like that's like e- there's a lot of people that are trying to do that, right? Wouldn't you say? And that still have never won a Caldecott, right? Like the three of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just true, but I do, I do have, a, I do have a true, a true actionable item on here. And what I think, if you look at another consistency here, is, um, of course, the quality is really high. And I think these people who are illustrating these particular books and and writing them too, since most people are writer illustrator, I think the big component is they believe in the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and the, a lot of people will take a job because, oh, I got to pay my rent and here's a job. And so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And then it, it doesn't really move you forward in a way that's meaningful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, I mean, one real takeaway I think is do meaningful work. And I think that gets you closer to this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether the lightning is going to mm-hmm. strike on you maybe or maybe not, but at least you can believe mm-hmm. in the work. Yeah. I think if you are getting into the children's book illustration world or, or that's a goal of yours, um, I think you've got to decide what is the type of creator you're going to be and what best fits your personality and what you want to work on. So, you know, are the stories in you, like, I just want to tell a story of, you know, a a character finding themselves and I'm doing it through this, like, you know, artistic way, or, or it could be, you know, a lot of the winners are bio pieces where it's like they, they find a, 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 person that might have been overlooked in history and they do a biography of them or it's someone that you're familiar with, like the Winnie the Pooh book Mm -hmm. that won, you know, you're familiar with Winnie the Pooh, but you're not familiar with how that character came to be. And so this person did a children's book all based on that, you know? So if if that's where you're more literary in the, in in your approach to your craft and, 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 and in, in the stories you want to tell, and lean into that and really do like follow your muse and believe in that. But if you're more like, oh, I just want to tell stories about like aliens who abduct parents and the kids, you know, uh, take over the neighborhood. And mm-hmm. those are the children's books I want to write. Then go all the way with that and have that be your thing. Mm-hmm. And, and you don't have to win an award to be successful and you don't have to uh, be a New York times bestseller to, to be successful. You could find, your audience and you can find the people that are into what you're doing. I, I, I attend that conference that I attended to a couple of weeks ago, Casey Neistat spoke at it and he's this um, YouTuber, popular YouTuber, you know, really influential in that world. But he was speaking to us as a creative to creators. And one thing that he said that really stuck with me was he said, do the thing that you, that you love to do and that you're good at and and just wait for the world to catch up to you because mm-hmm. eventually they will if the thing that you love to do is unique enough and you're really good at it eventually people will discover you and and and, and they're going to love it and you're, you'll find your audience so I, I think totally that's, believe in that i to go along with that i i attended the ala where um brian selznick accepted his caldecott for hugo cabray and if you look at that book, a lot of people were saying there's no way it could win. It was on the radar. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I say on the radar, there are popular editor blogs and uh, librarian blogs where they, they'll give their, their choices for Caldecott. Right. Right. So, the, so before the Caldecott is awarded in the midwinter conference, um, they'll just put out their short list of, of what they think – it, the Caligat could be picked from. And they're and trying to influence the judges. Right? They, I think, I think they probably are. Um, Do you think it Well, works? his was talked about a lot um, that year and it created a lot of controversy because I think a lot of children's book illustrators felt threatened that, Hey, you know, cause Hugo Cabret is a graphic novel. And I think a lot of uh, children's book illustrators felt a little bit like, Hey, this is our award, you know, go get your Eisner or something, or, you know, even though, Eisner's not for the for the uh, graphic novel, right? It's yeah, the, no, Eisner's is for graphic novels. Uh, graphic novels and but, comic books. But book. Hugo Cabret was literally an, a novel with tons of illustrations in it, it. Right. So, so then they're like, "Well, go get your Newberry somewhere else." But yeah, yeah. But I like there were people that were upset that it won the Caldecott because it's. But it, and I guess the the point that I wanted to make going along with what you were saying is, you know. Brian 
um, he went for it. I mean, like if you look at the volume of work in that book, it's insane. It, it's absolutely, and he had to make three trips to Paris to get more reference. And he, each time he would talk to his publisher and say, I need to go back over. And they got, they were totally behind him and they, they actually believed. And he talked about this in his acceptance speech that they believed in him and, and thought that he had a, a serious chance at winning this award. Publishers will really get behind books that they think could win this award because it, it means huge profits for them. Huge. I will say, I mean, that one book, though, uh, to, to be fair to the illustrators who felt that way, not that I don't think it's a beautiful book because it is, but I'm looking through all of the ones that won um, the Call the Cut, you know, 40 years worth right now and um, on the ALA website. And that's the one that if you have a child, you know, I'm uh, lucky I have a seven-year-old right now, so I'm right in the in the middle of all this, you know, reading these books and, and stories. And half of them are books that I bought just for myself. Half of them are stuff that I check out the library for him. That's the one that I can't read for him out of all yeah. of them. Every single one on this list, it's the one you can't read to your child for the most yeah. part. Yeah, it's very different, and it so was very the, controversial. I'll tell you another story real quick. Um, our our One of our friends that we have in common who was on the Caldecott Committee said that the one of the years that this person was on the committee, there was huge – half of the committee was really mad at the, at the book that won. They were really upset. And, mm. in fact, one of, the, one of the committee members wouldn't come to the dinner, the final uh, award ceremony dinner. He was just so disgusted at, at the book that won. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because if – I think it is a fool's errand – to go after this award, right? Because it can hinge on something as, as simple as, you know, half the committee doesn't even want your book, the book that won to win. That might've been the book that took the Caldecott away from your book, you know, so the, so even the committee is right. not totally behind it. And, and I've, I've, there's another thing called a mock Caldecott where have you ever, guys ever participated in one of those? No, but I've, I've, I've had a couple of books that have won, have won. Yeah, so basically a mock Caldecott is, is just groups of, of interested uh, people getting together and going through a, a, a simplified process of selecting books and then voting on them and then seeing which one their group would select. And I did that once with a friend and with, well, with two friends. And we, we found that just a faction of three among the 15 in the group, we could actually throw a vote away, knowing knowing the count from previous votes. It's kind of confusing, but basically, we could see which one was had won the number one slot before, and we we saw that our second pick was almost not in the running for an honor book. And so, instead of voting for the number one book again, I think the number one book had like ten votes. So we said, if the three of us don't vote give our, put our weight behind the number one book and we put our weight behind this, our second choice, we might be able to move it into the honor book category. And we did. And ever, no one could figure out how many, how many, how did so many people flop all of a sudden and get this book in there? And then we told them afterwards, we, we were like, well, we, we saw that this one was going to make number one. And so we, we just gambled and we threw our votes behind this other one. So there's things that can happen behind the scenes. Did I tell you about? I like. Did that. I tell you about the? I went to the to receive the award for the book in Minnesota, and the woman who was driving us around was a librarian who was working for this um, this award. But she was also last year or year before she was on the Caldecott committee, and I was like, "Oh, let me uh, just tell me about that. What, what's it like? How'd you get on there? What, what was it like judging and and?" Uh, and she said that um, they had so many books, so many books to read and to flip through. And mm-hmm. she's like, "What really what it came down to was we got a short list from everybody. Everybody just kind of said, here's my short list yep. of, of what I think we should do, what I think we should read. So that immediately like excluded all but 100 books, you know. And huh. then she said what it came down to is, is we're sitting here reading these books and we're narrowing it down and we're eliminating it. And all of them are so good that 
that it's not so much as which book is better, but what are the little things that are going to take this book out of the running. So it might be something as simple as there's no room on the cover for the sticker. Like mm-hmm. this is a good book, but it's funny but, because <laughs> illustrators actually joke about that. Like, and I've even designed in a blank space. Mm-hmm. You did that, didn't you? Jake? I did that, yeah, for one of my books. <laughs> but uh, I actually drew the call to cut sticker on my yeah. <laughs> as a placeholder. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I haven't done that. But yeah, if you know, they they it's between two books. One has a beautiful spot to put a sticker the other one doesn't they're going to they're going to go to that but they were also looking at what's the paper it was printed on what's the, wow. the the finish what are the what's the artwork in the um you know on the on the 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 overleafs and the 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 in papers and things like that you know they're looking at everything what's the font they used and so uh you know if it, if it all comes together and just looks like it could be a Caldecott winner it's more likely to win the award than, you know, one book that, that the cover just isn't quite there. Another thing I've heard is that you have these highly influential people that have been appointed to the committee. And mm-hmm. I'm talking about like, you know, li- head librarians for, you know, like mm-hmm. the New York City Library or something, you know, right. someone with a distinguished title. Former like presidents that. of the United States. Yeah. And then you have, <laughs> you have a school teacher, right? Uh-huh. And if the, if the, um, if if the the head of the New York Public Library is is also a very confident person, who's you know, let's face it, it, it personality wise, people come in all different flavors, and some people are overbearing, and some people are really take charge type people. So I've, I've I've heard several times where they've they've said in these committees, you'll have a couple loudmouths, and because of their position. Then, they can sway everybody. Well, then the then the school teacher or the small s- town librarian, who's also, you know, kind of a more meek person, doesn't want to ruffle any feathers and will just go along with what these loudmouths are saying. So, I guess in, in another sense, that's another reason why, you know, trying to do everything you possibly can to get this award is probably a fool's errand, right? Right. I mean, yeah. Well, I want to go back to that list, our our list of things you should do. And honestly, number two, be like John Klassen. <laughs> be like him in that he wasn't creating anything that had been done before. He was being himself. Yeah. And and yeah. I, honestly, if you're if you're looking at the winners this year and you're like, okay, I'm working on my book and I'm going to see what won this year and and kind of let that influence some of my decisions. You're going to be three years behind by the time your book comes out. Yeah, you know, um, and and really, what I think what wins and what's favorable is going back to that that quote is is doing the thing that you do well and letting the world catch up with you and putting out something that's unique and could only come from you and letting people decide whether they like it or not. And, you know, it might not be Caldecott material, but you created the thing that only you could create. It might be The um, the Snowman at Night by Mark Beener, you know, who he's exactly. never won a Caldecott, but he had immense commercial success with that book series, Snowman at Christmas, Snowman at Night, Snowman at the Picnic. Or, you know, he's got so many of those. And he he had done a lot of books and to with, you know, medium commercial success. And even to this day, he he has no idea why that one took off. But I mean, New York Times bestseller for many, many, many weeks, and um, the series is just it, you know it's put his kids in college. It's just you know done really yeah. well. I'd like to add add to the list, which which kind of talks about what you were talking about, Jake. The little things, um, design matters quite a bit, and so if you're going to be Somebody, I mean, I get students like this all the time that really want to just show that they can illustrate everything. And so every little corner gets illustrated. Not that you shouldn't put the things you think should be in there, in there, but having a good sense of graphic. I've always, I always say graphic design trumps illustration. And I know that gets a lot, rubs people the wrong way a lot of times. Um, but good design matters. And like, if you look at somebody who's a, a great painter, like, um, 
Chris Van Alsberg. I mean, he's a great illustrator, class, very classical, uh, but he's a great designer first, in my opinion. His pieces are just gorgeous as designs. Um, and that stuff uh, holds weight. Obviously, if you leave room for the type to breathe, uh, you know, where somebody, the designer's not trying to shove it in some little corner because you over illustrated, um, the whole package mm-hmm. matters. And so maybe that's a, a takeaway yeah, as well. Yeah, I agree with that. And you look at, you look at, you know, especially Klassen and even, um, even Dan Santat too, they all have that graphic design sense. And most of these guys are also, uh, doing the, the actual like title design, you know, it's, it's Mm -hmm. their handwriting or it's their like version of, of type design that they've hand done. So I think, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good takeaway. Was there anything else you wanted to add about this? Will? No, I just think that it's it's I think it's something that's important for people to be aware of, for illustrators to be aware of that this is this is a whole world out there that you may not know about. And if you are writing a more um I would I hate to use the word arty because it's just so vague, but I mean the Caldecott winners they are unique. You I think you could definitely say that. They're very diverse, they're very unique. They're um they're definitely I would say they. I would say in general the the messages that the stories have are messages of self empowerment, um, messages of um, inclusion. They're discovery. Not discovery. They're 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 not like what you said earlier. The fancy Nancy. They're not the the you know I, this is my truck in the sand kind of book you know and this is this is my bulldozer and, and not not typically a list book you know. Uh, more of a more right. of a story book or or um, about a political figure um, something along those those lines so if you feel if you feel like you fit in then maybe there are small alterations that you can make to make sure that you're at least in the running yeah but in general you know, this uh this is a podcast I wish I had heard ten years ago as I was getting into illustration. Uh, illustrating children's books and leaving animation. I didn't know anything about the Calicut. I'd seen the stickers on the books before, but that didn't mean anything to me. I didn't even think, oh, this is a good book. I just, you know, uh, it was just something. It was just, <laughs> I don't know, right. uh, adornment, right? Um, and so discovering what the Calicut was and discovering how the publishing world works uh, definitely like steered me for some of my projects and and helped me understand. So I feel like someone listening to this, if if they're new to illustration, they're new to the children's book publishing world, like here's your, you know, here's your primer on awards and how they work, specifically the Caldecott. I also feel like it like this episode is just this is the kind of conversation that illustrators get together and just kind of talk about and throw things out and and uh share stories and things like that. So if, if anything, if you had heard of the Calicot before, you at least got, yeah. um, you, you just at least got like shop talk. From my my first introduction to this was <laughs> I was sitting in a car. Uh, we were going to an event uh, at a book signing event. And the, one of the ladies in the car had been on the committee and she basically, we had this whole discussion and I was kind of new to, children's mm-hmm. books and I just sat in the back and just soaked it in, you know? So this is yeah. kind of that conversation, uh, minus the, the experts that have been on the committee before, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it's important stuff to know. And I, I do know people who are, you know, trying to at least put themselves in the running for Caldecott and, you know, maybe it will strike someday. There are definitely people who it's landed on multiple times, but it is life changing. And, and so if you can, if you can figure out a way to at least make sure that you're in the running, I think that's a good thing. If not, don't worry about it. Just do right. your thing. Well, there is a way to use kind of this as motivation too. Anyway, like how I use the the call to cut going through school and then and then transitioning from school to to working was I always thought it's so egotistical. But like I'm doing my first book and I'm like, okay, this has a shot at the call to cut. <laughs> you know, that's I'm thinking that in the back of my head. Um, and I didn't really think that, I guess, but I, I I was always just egotistical enough to think if it wins, I don't want to be embarrassed by anything in mm. it. So I want to do like a better mm-hmm. job. <laughs> 
so I don't have to like be like, oh, I should have, I wish I would have rendered that page a little better. I thought about the story a little bit better. So I just used it as like, is this call to cat worthy was my, and, and it, it, of course it wasn't, I wasn't a good illustrator at all. That's a good then. point. I think, um, That's yeah, cause there's, but it, there's it some for- spreads in some of my books where I just phoned it in. And if I had that mindset, it would have been like, okay, let's, let's take a breather, come back to this spread. Maybe and redo it. Redo it or, or put in, you know, a hundred percent on it and make it better. So uh, before we close this out, let's, let's go through our, our, our well, before our you list. do that, before you do that, I got one more question for you guys. Okay. Have one you more ever question. waited up for the call? No. Set your alarm. No, I didn't even know that's how it worked. <laughs> okay, I did. It was embarrassing. So, so they, the how it works is <laughs> is after the judging's done, before they announce it, they call you to let you know that you won it, and they meet all night. Yeah, they meet all night and, and the night before. Which which book? Which book did you think so you had it? With? I had or the is it mistake just a of one of my authors who was connected with some high powered people, and I don't want to say who it was in the ALA, our book that we did together, and I'm not going to say which one it was, was on the short list for getting an ALA reading list award. So she told me that it's, you know, she said, I just want you to know, don't get your hopes up. But I found out from, I'm not supposed to know this, but our book is, is up for the ALA. She said list, but I didn't know what that meant. I interpreted that as, Caldecott. So they announced the ALA also puts out a short list of books that they recommend that year when they announced the Caldecott. So my book was up for that. It wasn't up for the Caldecott, but I thought it was. So I wait, <laughs> I set my alarm early in the morning because apparently they call you and they all, they're everyone, they put you on speakerphone and they, they tell you that way. So yeah, I was like, I want them to reach my voicemail every time and I'm not going well, to call and them. A lot of committees have, see what the, disappointing stories like that where the person so ironically there's a lot of illustrators who didn't even know don't like they're they they literally did not know what a big deal caldecott is and so there have been stories of some illustrators going getting woken up at six in the morning and then just hanging up like it's a crank call kind of a thing right <laughs> like they're just like or being mad like why are you but why are you calling me at six in the morning they don't understand how it's going to change their life financially, that they'll have a, a large income for the rest of their life without doing anything. You know, the, you know what I mean? Like they, they don't get, they yeah. don't under, even understand any of those ramifications. Well, th- they don't put out a short list or no. anything, do they? No, the ALA puts out a short list that has nothing to do with the Caldecott committee, but it's announced with the Caldecott. And so that's okay. So, so nobody really, no one nobody knows truly the, the knows books even that didn't what that make short the list. honors, you know, like you have the Caldecott, two, three, four, five honors, you won't know the books right behind that. So you'll never know hmm. unless you are friends with a committee member who's willing to divulge, but they're not supposed to. They kind of swear an oath to that. And another, yeah. another really anecdotal story to go along with this is uh, I know a guy whose book was published by a small press and it w- winning the Caldecott was the most frustrating thing for him because his press could not keep up with demand. They did not understand the numbers. So is you know they and so they pretty much from what I understand they won't select books from small publishers anymore. Oh. They, well, at least they haven't since this one. Oh. They ruined it for everyone. Yeah. So what happened was this publisher. <laughs> Great. You know, the typical print run is ten thousand. Well, the typical demand for a Caldecott book is you know well into the hundreds of thousands of books the day it wins. So they had printed ten thousand. Then they printed an additional 50,000. By the time that those came available, they were gone. They printed another 100,000. Those were gone. And they could never keep up. So this poor illustrator was going to do all these book signings all over the country, getting flown around, and he never had his book to sign. Yeah, (laughs) so it was a nightmare for him. His publisher never – either they didn't have the money. So the big publishers – I know this is is like just extra information, but the big publishers have – five at least five different printers ready to go uh, with a moment's call they're they've clued them in on which books they think they could possibly win yeah and they make Get sure the that printers they're ready. warmed up 
Oh yeah, Get they're ready. ready. <laughs> and those big and those big printers wow. are ready to handle the demand. They've already got it lined up. So wow, that's. I'd like to um, I'd like to revisit this topic around the time of the next call to cut and see if we can pick it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we should try that. We'll do if our own little mock, ten, mock call to cut. If we could pick ten books and one of them is. Let's put out our list of what we, how we think's gonna. Maybe we should bet between us three, kind of have a, a pool okay. going. All right. On who can get the closest. And we could have the listeners bet on which one of us they think is going to win before they even know what our list is. Oh. Just, just from knowing who we are. <laughs> <laughs> Remember what I said earlier about my research, everyone. <laughs> Statistical <Right>. advantage. <laughs> Although Will sounds like he's the same way. <laughs> All right. To wrap it up, <laughs> number one. Um, take a look at your writing abilities and see if you could write stories that go along with your illustrations. Um, cause I honestly feel like it's one thing to illustrate a book and, and it's great what illust- illustrators can bring to the word someone else writes, but I've done both. I've written and illustrated and the, the, the books that I've written myself just have, there's just something about them that's a little bit more like it feels like it, it's coming from like a, a a purer place, right? Like, like it's something more unique and and more original. Maybe I don't know if that's if you guys feel the same way or not. But but look and see if you have that in you to also write and draw your stories. Number two, be unique to you. Don't don't look at what everyone else is doing and just do um, do what you're good at. And 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 find that, you know, find that thing that you can do and that you're passionate about. Number three, the details. Um, uh, learn graphic design. Learn composition. Learn how to do the nice finished trim to things, and 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 finding the right font, and and just having an eye for the details. And I think number what was number four? Um, oh, let let it drive you to create something really good. You know. Even though you may you're not in the running or you may not ever be, but have that mindset to where if this was to win an award, you wouldn't want anything in there to embarrass you. So, <laughs> put your hundred percent into every every aspect of it. So, those are the takeaways. Good, good. All right, where's my notes? <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. There's over 70 different courses on svslearn.com uh, that, you, that teach everything from how to draw everything to light and shadow to painting and watercolor to designing a book cover. Um, and it's all available. Each class is available individually or everything's available through the um, through the subscription, which is 30 bucks a month. So check that out. Check out svslearn.com if that's if illustration is something you're wanting to get better at and your hosts have been will terry you can find his work at willterry.com and his uh, instagram account is at will terry art uh, then we have lee white you can find his work at lee white illustration.com and follow him on instagram at lee white illo is that what it is yeah okay yeah. <laughs> i thought so <laughs> Uh, it's been deleted from my notes, so I'm just going off of memory right here. <laughs> and lastly, I am uh, Jake Parker, and my website is mrjakeparker.com. And uh, my Instagram account is at Jake Parker. And if you like this episode, please share it around. Tell everyone you know about what's going on over here at Three Point Perspective. You could subscribe to it on iTunes that way, um, or on Apple Podcasts, and that way you always know when a new episode drops. And we love the reviews. We've been getting over 200 five stars reviews at this time. So thank you so much, everybody, for that. Leave a review if you haven't done so already, because we'd love to hear what you guys think about everything. Um, lastly, if you want to join in on this discussion on the Caldecott, log on to the svslearn.com forum. Just go to the svslearn.com, click on forum. And there we have a thread posted about, um, about this episode. So chime in over there and let us know your thoughts. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you next time.